The Virtual Curbside is a production of the Utah Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Utah AAP, working together to improve children's lives through education, advocacy, and networking. Hi, this is Paul Workers from the Utah AAP. Welcome to this week's edition of the Virtual Curbside, where we bring pediatric providers together with subspecialists to get smarter about all things pediatric and better acquainted as a community of caregivers. The Virtual Curbside is brought to you in part by a generous grant from Primary Children's Hospital. Primary Children's Hospital, the child first and always. Welcome back to the Virtual Curbside. We're really fortunate this month to be able to visit with Pete Lindgren. Now, Pete is both a friend and one of the brightest guys I know, and also has the distinction of having been at the first uh, recording of the Virtual Curbside, which was a real disaster and never aired but he got to see the whole thing moving in slow motion disaster. So welcome back, Pete. Thanks, Paul. It's good to be here. And I will try to prove you wrong. I am not one of the smartest people you know. I find, I well, no, that's it's not up for discussion, but but I find, <laughs> I find that I can make the disasters move much more quickly these days. So they're not slow moving disasters anymore. I find that I can double speed the disasters. It is interesting that the disasters sometimes include Jeff Shunk. <laughs> well, clearly one of my favorite people in the world, um, but uh, I, I find talking to him with a script is always better than unscripted. So for <laughs> recording, for enduring purposes, for conversation, you just can't beat going unscripted. Well, so Pete, do you want to introduce yourself? So you are a pediatrician in private practice, right? Yes, I'm a pediatrician at the Memorial Clinic. I'm part of the Intermountain Medical Group, and I have the pleasure of serving as the medical director for Well Newborn Operations in the Canyons region for Intermountain Health. Medical director or czar, I think. As, as... I, I think you've referred to me as the baby czar in the past, which is, is, is a title that I'm going to adopt. Okay, feel free. Feel free. You can own it. So anyway, oh, before we start, uh, do you have any disclosures? Uh, my only disclosure is that I am not an expert. I'm just a good old country doc. That's also not true, but you've also, in your czarish uh, responsibilities, have done some very deep dives in some very interesting areas. And I think it's so important. I've been practicing long enough that I realize that many of our most cherished held beliefs are reasonable things for us to think about sometimes. And we're going to talk about one of those today. Indeed, we are. Okay. So we want to talk this week about bathing newborns, which sounds like it probably ought to be one of the more controversial topics we've ever tackled. Should we start? Let's dive right in. Because look, I think you did a poll of the various medical directors of uh, Intermountain Hospitals and asked them when a baby should be bathed for the first time. And there was, uh, I think there was probably a little bit of disparity among those people, but you also have asked in other groups, and there's a universal feeling that no baby should be bathed while he or she continues to have an umbilical cord attached to their abdomen, true? So this came up because the bathing practices in some of our hospitals didn't exactly kind of mesh with conventional wisdom. So the idea that we should keep the umbilical cord dry was sort of the idea. And our bathing practices actually suggest that immersion bathing is probably the way to go. The recommendations from the large organizations have suggested that immersion bathing is superior to sponge bathing. And it is counter to what I think most all of us have recommended, which is to do sponge baths until the cord dries off. And that actually is probably not ideal because it is, babies tend to have um, poor thermoregulation. They tend to be more upset. So again, it was just, it was a difference in sort of what we typically tell people, but differed from what the recommendations are. There was a study of the variation in bathing practices that was published in pediatrics in 2021. And suffice it to say, there's a lot of difference in terms of how we do this. And I think the big issue comes into play that as we give recommendations to parents and there are differences in practice, it leads to confusion and often mistrust. Right. When you say there's some disparity, 
there's quite a bit of disparity and, and some of it. Well, let's go back and talk about some of the variables that go into making a, an intelligent decision about bathing a baby. So you alluded already to the fact that bathing is stressful and that one of the things we don't want to do is make a baby cold and stressed. So we take that into account. The baby's skin integrity is something that comes into play. And also there's the thing we always talk about, and, and those are the issues of infection rates, both infection where we've damaged the skin, and the thing that we probably talk the most about is infection involving the, the umbilical cord. So when we talk about skin, it's probably important for us to remember that uh, skin is the largest organ of the body. And as I sometimes point out to my patients, it keeps the outside out and the inside in, and that's not trivial. It's not trivial, and it is something that is continued to mature in newborns. I think one of the things to think about is the elegance of how these things actually sort of all go together. So there are these adaptations that aid the process of going from a aquatic environment inside the uterus to being in an aerobic environment in air. And... So one of the things around that is that we have vernix that's made, um, which kind of starts being made around like 20 weeks gestation and continues to mature and has a myriad of functions. And we have over time gone from a process of wiping that stuff all away to knowing that it has functions that we should actually leave it in place. So what you're suggesting is that its function isn't finished once the you know the baby's been greased for a channel swim, that, that once the baby is now on dry land, isn't necessarily the time to wipe all of this stuff away. No, and, and it has a variety of functions. And one of the interesting functions is when babies are born, the pH of their skin is actually slightly alkaline and it becomes acidic. And there are Things with it help create that. And that's another one, um, both bacteriologic colonization and penetration. So there's a protective biofilm, essentially, that babies get that we have at times sort of just wiped away. So, you know, that's another one of those areas that some hospitals differ in, that the practice is to just try to get all of that off. And clearly, it should be something that's left in place. There's an irony, of course, in old practice that we'd see rarely anymore, and that's bathing the baby and then putting lotion all over the baby, where there's already a, an important biofilm in place. The other thing is, is as we look at the skin, so it helps uh, the integrity of the barrier, helps decrease the likelihood of dehydration and infection. Tell me what you've learned about the role of skin and our treatment of the skin in early infancy and uh, later atopy. So the thinner skin, and particularly skin that has some disruption to the integrity of the stratum corneum, allows both pathogens and allergens through. And there is some evidence that suggests that that may contribute to the development of atopic dermatitis. So one of the interesting things as we give advice about how often babies should be bathed we know that more frequent bathing actually ironically dehydrates the skin and puts babies at risk for a disruption of that skin barrier, making them more susceptible to sensitization from different topical allergens. And there's thought that having less frequent bathing may actually protect against the development of atopic dermatitis. Interesting. So let's move to the second concern, and that's the issue of infection. First of all, I think we can all agree that ompholitis is bad. It is bad. I have a question for you, Paul. Yes, sir. In your practice, how many cases of ompholitis have you seen? I'm counting. Uh, let's see. I've been in practice for almost 30 years. I'm counting. I'm counting. It's zero. I've, I've never seen ompholitis in, in one of my patients. So I'm at about 24 years. So between the two of us, we're batting a big zero. It's interesting, you know, in reviewing this, the rate of omphalitis is said to be about one in a thousand. And yet we've seen many babies between the two of us. Probably and, more than 2,000. Yeah, probably more than 2,000. So I think 
And, and again, there's sort of the division between, you know, resource rich countries and, and not um, with enphalitis. But it does seem that it is a worry that perhaps is real, but but small. Yeah. And so I think we've both been around long enough to have seen various approaches to this. A few years ago, the approach was make sure that you apply alcohol to the cord every time you change a diaper. We don't recommend that anymore. No, and it's interesting. One of the thoughts about that is that you may actually be removing some of the non-pathogenic bacteria, which may competitively inhibit the growth of like the pathogenic bacteria. So the, I mean, the recommendations are to do dry cord care. And again, the application of things like alcohol or chlorhexidine may actually be problematic for kind of developing normal skin flora. And, you know, it, it's interesting because one of the, the topics that comes up in various settings on this podcast are that the good germs are good. The good germs are good. On the other hand, you know, the cord is a really nice place for entry for bacteria. And, you know, we didn't mention this, but in mothers that have certain infectious issues like HIV, hepatitis, herpes, that early bathing is actually recommended to do. So delayed bathing, you know, in terms of like trying to promote things like breastfeeding and better thermal regulation is something that is not recommended, that that actually decreases, you know, the risk of colonization. And like a lot of things, it's, it's never just as simple as saying, we should always do this, you know, just one way. Right. But I think the negative corollary to good germs are good is that bad germs are bad. And I think if we take into account the fact that the cord structures lead directly to the central circulation, you know, and, and are a direct avenue to the inside of the body, if we know that there's something that's likely to be exposed there, it seems to make perfect sense then that we should do what we can to make sure that that avenue is not open. Absolutely. All right. The other thing that has struck me through the years, though, is that when we're treating burns, typically we treat burns partly because, as we've suggested before, that skin integrity is a good thing and doing what we can to preserve it, skin integrity is a good thing. But the treatment of burns often includes washing with soap and water. And it seems to me that if we're worried about omphalitis, that one of the things that to maybe consider is that at risk, that, that cleaning is, is not a bad thing. Cleaning is not a bad thing. And I think. As you brought up, the use of mild detergents or soaps helps emulsify the oils and dirts and removes those things and actually helps in maintaining that acidic pH. So bathing with just water actually is something that isn't recommended that you should use a mild soap. So a minute ago, you alluded to the Association of Women's Health Obstetric and neonatal nurses, A W H O N N A one. Tell me what I need to know about them because we're going to talk a little bit about some of their recommendations here coming up. Well, they basically have many recommendations about the kind of care and process around what we should be doing with babies. And they publish guidelines that are evidence based and are generally what we end up following in terms of the care of, of newborns. So this is sort of written into our nursing care practices. So tell me what the take home from this is then. What should the timing of a baby's first bath be? There was a time, and I've practiced in a time where babies were born, got the vernix wiped off them, and they jumped right into the tub. So the recommendation is to delay bathing until sometime between 6 and 24 hours, unless a baby has infectious risks from the mother. Okay. So that's, from a timing standpoint, 6 to 24 hours is preferred. Apparently, in that survey study that was done, if you're on the West Coast, it is more common to leave the hospital without being bathed at all. But that is like predominantly a West Coast phenomenon. And elsewhere, the practice in the nurseries that you are the czar for tends toward six to 24 hours. And the purpose for that is both so that you don't 
What What's the rationale for that? Well, I, I should also stipulate that one would not bathe until a baby has maintained both thermal regulation and they are like stable from a cardiopulmonary standpoint. So delaying bathing actually has some effect on helping with breastfeeding. So bathing could be a stress on babies and having them actually have some experience with latching on prior to that stress is beneficial. I think it's also true that it's time for parents to bond, right? You and rest. So bathing should happen once the baby's stable and not before. What should we be telling people about when a baby should next be bathed after they go home? Well, I think I think it's probably important to tell people that babies don't need to be bathed frequently. Bathing every couple of days is probably fine. Certainly, there are times when a baby needs to be bathed, but I think having having bathing every couple of days is probably reasonable. I think while we're doing fewer circumcisions in the hospital, the general kind of consensus seems to be to wait a couple of days after circumcision before doing bathing. But once people are home, it is okay to do immersion bathing or swaddle bathing and to not just do sponge bathing. Explain to me what swaddle bathing is. Swaddle bathing is a practice where babies are essentially swaddled in a towel or blanket and and then immersed in water um, so that they are actually essentially cuddled up while they're in the tub. It limits heat loss, basically. As you've pointed out elsewhere before, one of the things to keep in mind is that a sponge bathing baby is probably the most thermostressful thing to do. It is. And I would say that most of us don't prefer sponge bathing. Right. But but the message that people have mm-hmm. gotten going home is that you should sponge bathe your baby until the cord is off. And of course, the irony of that is that this is a baby whose skin is thin, whose surface area compared to their masses is abundant, and we're cooling them off with a sponge bath. That's well put. Well, then we'll leave it at that. What's the intelligent thing to be telling people about cord care? Keep the cord dry. I think it's probably good for us to continue to be diligent about watching for signs of infection. Certainly, if there is you know, irritation, a malodorous smell, irritation around the cord, that's probably something that's worth looking at. But in general, uh, keeping the cord dry is a very simple standard way of preventing infections through the cord. And again, I think as both of you and I can testify, that practice has been good in terms of not having many cases of alkalitis. And so when you say keeping the cord dry, does that mean you don't wash the cord if you bathe the baby after the baby's gone home or, or that you dry the cord carefully after you've bathed the I baby? I think it's dry the cord carefully after you've bathed the baby. I do find that people who are rule breakers and wash the cord usually have less malodor about the cord. That may be true. Well, I don't know for sure. And I haven't studied that uh, systematically. As you've done a deep dive into bathing babies, and as I said, this is not a trivial subject because we have framed this as being something that this, we're trying to avoid a very dangerous thing by not bathing babies who have just gone home from the hospital except for in the cases where a baby may have been exposed to infectious agents, giving them a longer time before their first bath in the hospital. Both those things have challenged our previous practice and preconceptions. As you've done a deep dive into all these bathing issues, what are the big questions that you think still need to be answered? Are there things that you still wish you had a better idea about? You know, I think one of the topics that people, I think, ask us often about are, you know, what should we do in terms of like baby lotions and creams? And I think 
it would be interesting to know whether the use of emollients actually does have some effect on you know, emergence of things like atopic dermatitis, which is really common. So I think that would be one thing. I don't think that there are a ton of questions, but I do think it would be nice if people could be more uniform on the messaging that goes out about bathing. But to that end, I would point out that there is no national recommendation or standard on bathing practices for newborns. The Association of Women's Health Obstetrics and Neonatal Nurses has a recommendation about bathing that is evidence-based, but there is nothing from the AAP that suggests that there is a single way that we should be doing this. Surveillance of the area around the court, I think, is, is important. What do you advise people about moisturizing a baby after they've gone home? You know, I've always recommended a rather minimal approach. You know, I think we all get to see babies in the two-week range who have flaking of skin. And oftentimes people say, well, you know, they're really dry. And I think that it represents more a proliferation of the stratum corneum and having some of that keratin come off, which is perhaps a way of keeping babies from drying out. But I think some of that has fallen into the area of parental preference. I think everybody gets a gift at a baby shower of some kind of lotion. And I, I don't think it's unreasonable to use, though the lotions tend to be more water content based, whereas the kind of thicker creams are probably more useful. So I don't really know what the best answer for that is. That would be a nice thing to answer. It does seem to me, and, and this may just be my practice, but it does seem to me that I see much less of the thinner baby lotions, the more watery and uh, the ones that evaporate more quickly. I think I see a lot fewer of those these days than I used to. Yep. All right. Well, there are bound to be questions. For those of you who have questions, please send your questions to uh, questions at vcurb.com. And Dr. Lindgren will be happy to, to answer those for you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. Make sure and recommend this to your friends and, and, and neighbors and, and relations. And Dr. Lindgren, if you're up to it, we'll talk again next week. I'll see you again next week, Paul. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to getting together again next time. The virtual curbside is available on iTunes or wherever you find your other favorite podcasts. Be sure to like us and subscribe. We want you to like us both because we're needy that way and because that will help other listeners like you find us. Check out our website, vcurb.com, for supporting materials, schedules, and other great stuff. The Virtual Curbside is an educational production of the Utah chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The opinions expressed in this podcast, while carefully considered, are ultimately the opinions of the presenters and not necessarily of the American Academy of Pediatrics or our employers. And remember, the content of this podcast shouldn't be seen as a substitute for seeking actual personal medical care. If this is an emergency, hang up and dial 911. Otherwise, schedule a visit with a caring health care provider to try to get to the bottom of your concerns. None of this could happen without Elisa Stoddard, our extraordinary executive director of the Utah AAP. Many thanks to Tim Cosgrove for his help on the website and logo design. Production design and editing thanks to Phil Workus, who also composed the theme music. See you next time.